episode two of the sneak preview here. I'm Connor Izagari. I'm Austin Johnson. And this is our newest podcast dedicated to following the current film release calendar as best we can in these difficult times. In our first episode, we said goodbye to 2020 by giving out our top 10 best films of the year. And in this episode, we're going to be introducing our typical format for most of the episodes going forward. Today's episode will focus on the January 7th Netflix release, Pieces of a Woman, starring Vanessa Kirby, Shia LaBeouf, and Ellen Burstyn, among others. So every week, roughly, we're going to be covering a new film or films that's currently released, regardless of um, format, you know, streaming, theaters, whatever we can stumble upon, whatever we got. So Pieces of a Woman is what we went with this week. And yeah, uh, yeah, what a dark film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, Netflix is obviously a, a fundamental thing that will be used for this podcast and just how 2021 is going to look. You know, a lot of streaming service, you know, usage, uh, obviously, HBO Max has a ton of flicks coming out. Uh, you know, I'm excited. I'm excited for the run of movies. I, I, of course, wish we could see them in theaters, but we take what we can get, right? And as a movie fan, I am excited that all of these are so convenient at such a fast pace. So uh, I'm, I'm ready to buckle up. And this was a, I'm not going to say a fun start, but a good start. Uh, Pieces of a Woman is uh, a superb, you know, film and a wonderful piece of filmmaking from Cornell Mundroko. I don't really know how to say it yet. I think you have to skip a couple letters there. Uh, <laughs> I've been trying to look how to how to pronounce it. I, I just think I think this movie is really special, and I, I I'm excited to talk about it today. Yeah, it's um, it would it was not my you know choice for our first you know current release. It's just kind of the way it worked out. Yeah, it is. It's 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 an acquired taste. Not everyone's going to dig this one. I get that. This is very dark subject matter. Going to trigger some people, but. Uh, yeah, I thought I thought it was very powerful, and uh, just I thought these two guys, the uh, director and the screenwriter here, I thought they captured like kind of the downfall of like the windfall of human emotion better than a lot of filmmakers I've seen. Like these guys, it, you believed it; it really felt real, and there's a reason for that, and I'll get into that as we get into the show. Hell yeah! But first. We got to see what happened last week in film. Last week in film. All right. So it was a busy week. Uh, A lot of interesting stuff happened. Uh, Let's touch on some of this stuff. So the upcoming DC flick, The Suicide Squad, has been confirmed to be rated R which is a very good move. Uh, James Gunn is helming it. Going to bring some of that Guardians of the Galaxy flavor to the DC party. And with an R-rated Suicide Squad movie, I feel like this movie just got a lot cooler and the anticipation got a lot bigger. What do you think? Yeah, for sure. I just, um, you know, I'm quite frankly tired of having the conversation about anticipation for DC because of how many times it just flops and we're just disappointed and we had the same conversation over and over. So moving forward with their shit, I'm just going to wait till it comes out and they can prove me wrong because uh, I, I feel like fans deserve have, 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 have not deserve have earned that spot to say that you need to prove this to us DC. Cause at this point, this past decade has not been pretty. And we we've talked about it plenty on filmgasm and you and I feel pretty strongly about, how how much better the MCU is. And that's that's just a fact. It's not it's not opinion at this point. And you know, we want to see them make the right moves. And this is the kind of stuff you do. James Gunn, R rating. These are the kind of right moves behind the scenes. But again, I just don't believe it until I see it. I get it. I get it. You've been burned too many times. I get it. And I and I'm not even a big superhero, like big superhero fan. So why would I just put my shit out there over and over? <laughs> <laughs> and like you said, get burned, you know, and even when I'm not that attached to the characters. So, yeah, I, I'm i going to, you know, watch it, but I'm not going to, you know, build, build this anticipation in my head that it's going to be a great movie because I, I haven't even watched Wonder Woman, man. I still haven't even watched it because of the backlash and the and that conversation is just, 
not as much fun to me as it is uh, the one around a movie like Pieces of a Woman. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. And with me, you know, these are characters I've waited years to see in mm-hmm. live action and on the big screen. And people, you know, I've been looking forward to this shit for my whole life. And to see this stuff yeah. crumble like this, yeah. it hurts. Each one of these films that sucks hurts. But with The Suicide Squad, to have James Gunn backing this, to have a director who is so sure of a hit, like he's the best guy you could have behind the camera for a film like this. True. And an R rating, which means they're not pulling punches. True. I that's two check marks I really don't want to ignore. And you're right. It is it's I don't know. The, the odds are not in the film's favor. They really aren't. But, but those I, are good fundamental moves. They are. Yeah. They are. But you know, I, I just I always feel like like a like I'm in a bad relationship with DC. Like I always have to keep defending the good news, forgetting all the bad shit that they keep fucking up. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't, isn't that, isn't Suicide Squad coming out on HBO, uh, HBO max? Probably. Yeah. I think it's part of the deal. So we'll definitely do an episode. So yeah, like I'm, I'm keen on watching it, you know, and actually sitting down. I'm not, I'm not saying that I, I, I'm going to ignore it when it comes out. But I, I am keen on watching it when it first comes out. But but I, you know, I want that two hours while I'm sitting on the couch to be to be worth it. I really do, because we talk about it a lot. Pete, not, I'm not talking about just you and I. I'm talking about movie fans in general. You know this this realm we all live in. And we talk about superhero movies a lot, whether they're good or bad. And sometimes I, sometimes I wish we would just kind of leave it leave it alone. You know, <laughs> and that's happened a lot with DC. I just want to leave them. <laughs> Yeah, but Batman looks awesome, doesn't it? <laughs> Matt Reeves. Hey, Matt Reeves. We j- we literally just did uh, an episode on Chinatown you know, yesterday uh, for Oscar Sunday. So that movie apparently is a huge influence and inspiration for Matt Reeves, the Batman. And those kinds of things are good signs. <laughs> the fu- The fundamental moves are there, man. You know, they are there. I, I just, I, we got to see it, you know? And I know like you, you've literally, you've been hurt. <laughs> you've yes. been punched in, you've been punched in the face a few times over these movies, you know, some of the, some of the Batman and Superman stuff and just hasn't connected Wonder Woman 1984 just hasn't, hasn't made sense. The first Suicide Squad. Yikes. And yet I keep crawling back because as I've said many times on multiple podcasts, I'm Hollywood's bitch and I'm well aware of that. <laughs> as am i as it's, it's it's tough not to be these days huh <laughs> yeah very tough silicon uh, valley's bitch <laughs> in the same rating vein um it was announced that the upcoming coming to america is going to be rated to pg-13 which i think is not a good move <laughs> yeah um, yeah i mean I, I, another one i'm gonna watch but that that's weird to see that it is is very very bizarre i, I you know very much enjoyed the Eddie Murphy comeback from a little over a year ago now with Dolomite is my name on Netflix. And I thought it was going to be kind of, you know, keep taking steps forward in the right direction of trying to sort of resurrect his career. Yeah. And now, and now I think maybe it's two steps forward, one step back. We'll see though. We'll see. Uh, I just PG 13 is odd. I, I think Eddie Murphy's most effective when, <laughs> when he's able to say the F word as much as he wants. Yes. <laughs> Eddie Murphy is at his best when he's not tethered, when he can do whatever the fuck he wants. And the first coming to America was, was R. And it's one of the most hilarious films of his entire filmography. And to kind of, you know, put training wheels on the sequel, not, not a good idea. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah, it'd be like saying Samuel Jackson, sorry, buddy, you can't say motherfucker more than once. You know, Eddie Murphy, you're not allowed to use these words for, yeah, for the sake of, sake of your comedy sake of your the punchline and that doesn't feel right especially after dolomite because his vocabulary obviously is just is incredible in that so you want to see that kind of keep going right that's something that's really amazing about his his timing and his comedic ability so i don't know um we'll, we'll see we'll definitely be doing that one on this show i think um coming on amazon prime so yeah. I, I would love to do that on this show i would love to hell yeah i hope it's good <laughs> we'll um, see hey 
Well, whether it's good, we go, we go in, you know, we gotta, it's we gotta see for ourselves. Yeah. It's we gotta see for ourselves. It's not up to us. Um, <laughs> speaking of movies that I don't really care about, Netflix is developing a sequel to We Can Be Heroes. Robert Rodriguez's recent film, he, uh, the sequel to Shark Boy and Lava Girl that nobody asked for is now getting a sequel. And I think it was a big hit on Netflix because people really just did not have anything else to watch. (laughs) And I just, I'm so tired of Rodriguez like sticking to kids movies. I don't know why he keeps doing this. He's so good at just mind bending action adventure, crazy shit, but he keeps making kids movies, (laughs) bad ones too. (laughs) Yeah. Bad, 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 bad. I don't have much to say about this topic. Um, this is some of the stuff that's frustrating though about <clears throat> about about where we're at like what people are making just to just to make some money just to sell something just to just to make movies I, I don't really know man it's 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 a weird place we're in the craziest thing about that is rodriguez i truly believe he thinks he's making great cinema with these it doesn't feel like a paycheck gig to him it feels like this is something he's been working on for years and he did it for his kids or something like he is de- he's dedicated to this <laughs> So I don't know uh, how you make somebody of that habit. I just don't. I, I want, you know, El Mariachi 4 but or Machete 3, but nope. <laughs> or this is what we get. I, I would I, I would love, you know, of course, I think there's a lot of people who would, who would agree, and I think you do, is uh, can we get something original from him? Yeah. Like, a, a, a new thing? <laughs> uh, yeah, he revisits a lot. He revisits and attaches things and and – that's great to, you know, add on to worlds and whatnot, but occasionally it'd be cool if you could show that you have some other kind of idea in the bag and it'd be nice from him. Well, Rodriguez is currently latched on to executive produce a lot of those Star Wars shows that are coming out on Disney Plus. So I'm okay with that because he brought some really cool flavor to The Mandalorian. So if we can get more, you know, if we can get Rodriguez on that side of things, it'll keep him from doing dumb shit like this. So, okay, I'll take it. Yeah, I just, you know, I just, I, I think it'd be cool if he did like a, another, you know, action style movie, maybe sort of like Machete with, with a younger actor who's like in his prime right now. It'd be kind of cool. I don't know. Just, just something like it. that. Come up, come up with like a new cool badass character because he's great at that. And I love when he comes up with new ones. I'd love to see Rodriguez take his flavor and make a tried and true Western. I think that'd that be cool. would yeah. that would be bitching. Get like a Hispanic Lee, like Diego Luna, in a like a Western kind of man with no name style story. I think that could rock. Yeah, like Diego Luna and Pedro Pascal, like just riding through the West. Yeah, man. Rock, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rob, Rob, come on. Rob, do we have to do yeah. all the work? Rob, come on, Rob. <laughs> uh, moving on. So. There is currently a uh, remake of Matilda in the works, a adaptation of the Broadway musical. Um, Captain Marvel co-star Lashana Lynch has joined the cast in an unspecified role. Um, kind of mixed about this. I love Matilda. It's one of my favorite movies. But I didn't know that. Yeah, Matilda is a, a big favorite of mine. I don't. You know, you and I talk about a shit ton of movies, but occasionally there will be one where I'm like, what? I didn't know you liked that one, you know, or like that you had a attachment. And that that's funny. That's one of those. I, I don't think we've ever talked about that movie. You haven't. Yeah, it's I just assumed I don't at this point in our friendship. I just assume, you know what I like. And I assume I know what you like <laughs> <laughs> until until something happens. And you're like, whoa, yeah, <laughs> what? Yeah, <laughs> but I think an adaptation of the musical could be kind of interesting. It's, you know, it's, it's a reimagining of the story. It's I, I'm, I'm in, I'll, I'll give it a chance. Well, yeah, shit. I will too. You know, if it, it you know, it sounds like a, something you're, you're big on and you have a personal attachment to. So I think it'd be cool if I could uh, kind of, kind of see why, kind of see what's going on there. Maybe, maybe we could, you know, figure out a way to do the old one and the new one, you know, it'd be fun. Well, Matilda's, you know, it's a fantasy kids movie. That's right. That's the book. It goes right in there. Yeah. There you it's, go. Yeah. Directed by Danny DeVito. I mean, and why wouldn't I love that movie? It's it's hilarious. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Yeah. And you know, as a you know, I connected with Matilda a bit as a kid. I was a big reader, you know. I liked 
I was a little bit ahead of other kids in the class. I was, you know, one of those, they, they called it gifted, but really all it does is, you know, not prepare you for when you meet people smarter than you. But um, yeah, I liked that movie because she was a gifted child who liked to read. And so was I. Hell yeah. That's cool. Um, this is interesting and inevitable. Uh, so have you been keeping up with uh, Ray Fisher's fight against Warner Brothers? A little, little bit. I, I've, I've heard more than I've read. I've, I've heard some stuff uh, on some, some podcast, uh, and then I heard, heard some stuff on NPR, just a bit about it, but not haven't read too much about it. Well, he finally, well, I guess, got what was coming to him. Yeah, yeah. Warner Brothers. He's been written out of The Flash, and Cyborg, his character, will apparently not be recast. Yeah. So yeah. turns out if you keep attacking the studio that hired you, they're going to fire you. Yeah, just annexed just yeah. you're done i don't know if what he said was true i don't know if there were you know if joss whedon was abusing the, the crew all i know is ray fisher did not have the clout to be saying what he was saying and now there goes his career <laughs> so yep no more cyborg in the dceu <laughs> kind of a shame uh another character that just was not developed enough to care about <laughs> and uh now I guess we'll never see him again. <laughs> Oof. Um, this was interesting. Paramount is developing a Spamalot movie, which basically means they're remaking Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Spamalot Lots of remakes, but this is yeah. interesting. Spamalot is is it is a hilarious thing. I got to see it uh, at the Majestic. Or not the Majestic at the Tobin Center uh, before COVID hit. It was last year's uh, birthday present, I think. And it's so funny. It's Holy Grail with bits of Life of Brian and a lot of new shit. It's so, so good. And if they get the right people involved, this could be really special. <laughs> so I'm crossing my fingers. <laughs> Span a lot. Yeah, I mean, this is a... This is, uh a way that things are going as well as we of course are covering current things on this show on sneak preview. We, we see a lot of uh, things that are going to come back, you know, come back to life. That's the way a film has been moving for a while now for, I would say it's been working that way for years. And we're, we're at some points with stuff like that, I think reaping the benefits of it, right. You know, where if someone is, depending on who's in control and if they respect, you know, respect it, then we can really see something cool, like come back to life a little bit. So that we'll keep, we'll keep a radar on that. Yeah, I think so. I'm going to see it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. This was interesting. Damien Chazelle's next film, a film called Babylon has been pushed to December, 2022. And uh, this film Babylon, I knew nothing about this. Uh, Plot is unknown. It's rumored to be set to be a uh, period film set in Hollywood. Current cast members include Brad Pitt and rumored uh, Margot Robbie and Tobey Maguire. Yeah, it was supposed to be Emma Stone, but she's pregnant. So Margot Robbie is taking her place is what I've heard. And that's fine with me. Margot and Brad together again. <laughs> yes, I love, love, love the, that connection. And then working with someone like Damien, who I think had some brilliant things going on in La La Land. I don't think it's an overall brilliant film. I think it's got good things happening in it. And he clearly has an admiration for some old Hollywood stuff. So that will be really cool whenever it does get to come out. Yeah. And as we, you know, talked about with Mank on Oscar Sunday, we love films set in old Hollywood. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. To have Jamie and Chazelle helm one of those. Holy shit. This could be special. Yeah. Yes. Next up, uh, very excited to hear this. Netflix has purchased the rights to The Woman in the Window, which was supposed to come out this uh, last year, got pulled off the calendar indefinitely because of COVID, and now it finally has a home. So this year, uh, I've heard in the first half of the year, The Woman in the Window will be coming out finally. Uh, This film stars Amy Adams, Anthony Mackie, Gary Oldman, Julianne Moore, Wyatt Russell, and a handful of others, and it's essentially Rear Window. but I'm assuming there'll be a twist to it. Yeah. It looked intriguing. (laughs) 
Yeah, no, very, very interesting cast. Yes, indeed. I was wondering where that went. Like everything kind of got, you know, rescheduled to this year and then that movie was just gone. <laughs> so, glad to hear it's got a home. Yeah, it's come back to life and here we are. Yeah, we're, there's going to happen a lot, man. This year, there's going to be a lot of things that will just, just be like, oh shit, that's out on something for free. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It'll happen left and right. Um, and then there's one trailer I'd like to talk about uh, of the upcoming uh, drama Malcolm and Marie starring Zendaya Ooh. and John David Washington. Mm. Uh, very intriguing drama. This looks like it's going to make some waves. I believe it's a Netflix movie. Yes. Sam Levinson. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thoughts. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I didn't even watch the trailer. This is the kind of, this is the kind of thing where I see the actors in it and I see Sam Levinson, the creator of euphoria is, has made a movie under, you know, COVID, you know, quarantine he, he's done everything inside of one building it seems like with these two actors uh i'm in i don't need to see a trailer you know it's that kind of thing and i can't wait because it's so you know it's only like a month away i chose to yet yeah, i'm just going to go into this kind of sort of blind uh and i'm very 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 excited that's interesting i i can't i can't do that with new movies i'm i'm way too tempted i love trailers I, it's really I can't ignore them. I I I skip a lot of trailers, like like pieces of a woman. I don't know, like I didn't need to see a trailer for that. I was like I I that looks like my kind of movie. Uh, I'll, I'll watch it, and it, it happens a lot. I do love trailers though. It's like a, it's a whole different craft that I think is getting lost. <laughs> I yeah. think I think trailers used to be. I think there was a time when trailers were like just all time. And, you know, occasionally you still get them here and there. Like, I think the Hereditary trailer was was really, really strong. Uh, that's one that stands out from the past few years. But, uh, yeah, man, I, I totally get that. But for this particular movie, Sam Levinson's a guy I just, I'm so excited for his, his future. Uh, Euphoria is, like, not the most well-told story uh, or TV show. <clears throat> But what he's doing to change how TV can be, you know, can be filmed, I'm all for it. I'm I'm 100% for it. He's he's changing exactly what we think TV can be uh, as we speak, and I, I think that's really really special. Uh, and he also showed some chops with the, I believe it was like 50 minutes. It was a short between uh, Domingo Coleman's character from. Uh, Euphoria and then Zendaya's character from and it's it's like unbelievable you know it shows shows true vision and this guy this guy's got a future man I can't wait and this is I obviously this is a this is a big deal for his career so I'm yeah. excited comes out Netflix February 5th uh, we will probably be doing it on this show oh yeah no doubt <laughs> and uh, I just want to say from the trailer the, I get a big lighthouse vibe I see. I see what you mean from just like I've seen photos and the poster. Like photos yeah. and the tone is very much like, you know, going at one another with something, some kind of thing overarching it. it I'm excited to see what this exactly is. Yeah. Yeah, man. Me too. Well, no, yeah, it's going to happen on this show. Uh, there's no, no doubt in my mind. Uh, when there's a film like that that's coming out on Netflix, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Thank God for those streaming services. We could not do this podcast if we didn't have those streaming services. Yeah, you know, and it's just funny when you look back, just if you just took the past couple of years, for example, you know, look at uh, before 2020, you look at 2019, 2018, there's, there's incredible films coming out through these streaming services. But now it's like all of them are coming. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, a huge, huge, you know, by the handfuls are, are coming out through these services, through HBO Max, through Prime, through Netflix, you know, through Hulu, whatever it may be. And it's, it's a lot at once, you know, it's a lot to keep up with if you are a big movie fan, because there was a time, even in our lives, you and I, where it was, you just go to the theater as many times as you can. And that was it for new movies. That was it. And then you see them on DVD or rent them or whatever. And that was it. Now, you know, these, these high quality, you know, these incredible actors, incredible directors and writers, they're all coming out on these and we're, we're witnessing it actually change and happen in front of our eyes. Um, 
And I'll, I'll be honest, you know, I went through a time where I thought this show wouldn't know exactly where to be because of the theater situation. But then I, you know, then you just look at it. Oh my gosh, there's going to be so many films, you know, finding a home because this is where we're at. This is the, where the industry is moving, at least for right now. And uh, while that's sad, I do still want to be a part of it so bad. And that's, this is what it's about, you know, getting excited for, for the Sam Levinson movie coming out on Netflix is building that anticipation is part of it. And that's anticipation I'm down for. Uh, I, I'm, I'm excited about that stuff. You know, One Night in Miami on Amazon Prime. I'm down to build anticipation for that, you know. Uh, and that's part of the deal, right? As a movie fan, you got to be a part of that um, noise so you can get the word of mouth and get people try to, you know, get excited to watch stuff. And this is where we're at in 2021. We want to get back to the theater, but for right now, we still have to respect the medium, you know, and, yeah. and that you, you and I are going to be on this journey together. And I, I can't wait, man. It's going to be fun to, to ride the wave. And Netflix is certainly a part of it, you know? Well, and getting to, you know, like you said, experiences in real time experience, real change and get to record it almost for posterity here to be like this, you know, we were there. It's kind of cool. And also because of all these streaming services and the films that are coming out, not once do I feel like I'm, you know, settling. It's all good stuff. And that's, that's the great, that's best. That's the best. Yeah, no, it's not just these, like, you, you know, it's not just these bullshit films coming out. Like, I mean, just in 2015, 2015, my man was when Netflix released their first ever, you know, new, new film, Be, uh, what was it called? The one with Idris Elba. Oh, Christ. No Nation, uh, yeah. Yeah, I love that movie. I couldn't think of the title. Um, that was their first, you know, initial boom. This is our first film that we're going to come out with that's ours, that's new, and we don't need the theater. <clears throat> and they started doing it more and more. And, of course, there's people who have their qualms with that. But, but we're, six years later, you know, we're watching it, you know, really, really actually come to life and become the movie industry, movie industry in 2021. So uh, most certainly, man, our, our adult lives, you and I has been this journey has been a witnessing it. And we probably have taken the theater for granted at times. Um, I know I have, I, I, there's been moments where I, I just totally didn't realize how bad it was going to suck for them to be gone, but I'm not going to disregard the medium. I love so much just because I have to sit at home and watch them. <laughs> I'm still going to still going to eat them up. Yeah, man, for sure. It's, um, God, it's six years. It's really only been six years. <clears throat> God. It this, feels this, yeah, this journey of Netflix, like, really becoming its own f fucking studio of making movies and being an Oscar contender. It's, they're, they're a baby. They're a child. And they're making, they're not, I'm not, I don't want to say make, but they're releasing, distributing Mank and Roma and marriage story and the Irishman right? like, Whoa, man, <laughs> these are, these are like criterion selected movies. That's fucking crazy. And that's a special place to be in, in such a short time. I think if we can get there in six years, what's going to happen in the next couple. Yeah. Oh, Holy hell. I mean, that's a hell of, I mean, that's completely changing the distribution of film in just six years. That's amazing. I didn't like, because it's been such a constant in our lives, I feel like at this point I've had Netflix forever. Yeah, it's hard yeah, to, for it's, sure, for it's sure. Hard to remember the, like the time before we had such easy access to all these films. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. We both, you and I, both turned twenty six this month here in January, and I mean, yeah. Think about the six years since we were twenty. So, just while we've been kind of totally making our own decisions in everything we watch and being being conscious adults of our decisions and going out to the theater and paying our own money and all that stuff. It's been the entire time that Netflix has been doing their, their movie thing. And so you and I have totally been able to, and also it, it's been an advantage and a disadvantage in that you go to the theater less, but you have these movies at home on a service that you already pay for, for all these other things that you get enjoyment out of it. it of, everyone knows this. It has pros and cons there. There's, you can talk about it all day but it is fascinating to look at how fast it's happened. So, so amazing. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So cool. So cool. Yeah. We're constantly going to be talking about Netflix and Hulu and HBO max and Amazon and shutter and all these services just kind of dominating 
the film landscape right now because of COVID. So this conversation will never really end. Yeah. Um, I want to close this segment with uh, the announcement of three unfortunate deaths this week in the film industry. Yeah. Uh, Barbara Shelley, the proclaimed first leading lady of British horror, has died at 88 years old uh, due to COVID-19 complications. Uh, her biggest film, I would argue, is uh, 1960s Village of the Damned. And uh, she's been kind of a steady voice in early British horror uh, since the 50s and 60s. So sad to see her go. Village of the Damned is still one I really have to check out. It's been on my list for years. Same. And it would be just such a wonderful filmgasm episode. Maybe we can do that for her one day. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Uh, next up, um, actress Marion Ramsey has died at 73 years old from a currently undisclosed reason. Uh, she's mostly remembered as the character of Officer Hooks in the Police Academy franchise, for those of you who remember that uh, interesting franchise. Have you seen the Police Academy movies, any of those? Nope. Just not a road I've ever gone down. The first one's pretty funny. The second one's okay. The next seven suck. <laughs> Yikes. They just yeah. kept going. <laughs> yeah, I knew there. I thought there was five or six. I didn't know that. Yeah. Jeez. And Officer Hooks is a funny character. She's this very short, unassuming black woman who whispers very quietly until she gets pissed. And then she screams at the top of her lungs and scares the shit out of people. <laughs> it's, it's a funny recurring gag. So she'll be missed. And finally, um, director Michael Apted has died at 79 years old from uh, an also undisclosed reason at the moment. Michael Apted is a pretty celebrated director. Some of his films include Coal Miner's Daughter, uh, Gorillas in the Mist, The World is Not Enough, and the uh, documentary series known as the Up series. Uh the world is not enough. I had no idea this guy put his, you know, put his name in the Bond franchise. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you you just just got to learn that. That's awesome. <laughs> Unreal. And the Up documentaries, I've heard about them for a long time. It's this, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's this documentary series that started a, f a few decades ago where Michael Apted had a selection of kids at seven years old that he filmed. And then every seven years, he revisits these kids to see how their lives are going. And he got like all the way up to like 56. And I think one more after that, 63 up. That was the last one. Gosh. So pretty amazing. That kind of consistency. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. Mm -hmm. I will. Yeah. Coal miners, daughter and gorillas in the mist. Regrettably two movies. I haven't seen. I, I would like to. Yeah, of course. Uh, films that could definitely come up on, on the podcast at some point, uh, Oscar Sunday, maybe. <laughs> That would yep, that would be the spot. Yeah, looking at his filmography, Nell, uh, mm -hmm. Nuff, Rome, Masters of Sex, like this guy, underrated as hell. Yeah, one of those names that just doesn't pop up. There's there's just with with directors and, and guys, there's too few names that we all always talk about and you, you know memorize their names. And there's these guys that are kind of a tier below. Yeah, that we just don't we we don't know their names enough, and th that's right where he would be. Yep, well said. It's a, it, I call it the I call it the Paul Schrader tier. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, so that's what happened last week in film. Uh, yeah, recurring segment. We'll learn more about current movie news next week. Let's get into the big one: pieces of a woman. Mm. So this film came about after the film's writer, uh, Kata Weber, lost her baby with the film's director, her partner, Cornell Mundrosko. Uh, they had an unsuccessful pregnancy, and this film was very personal to both of them. I'm sure it was a way to kind of deal with this. So that's why this film is so strong. You can tell that this meant a lot to the two of them. Um, it premiered at the Venice International Film Festival in September 2020 where Vanessa Kirby won the Volpe Cup for Best Actress. The film has unfortunately been overshadowed by controversy surrounding Shia LaBeouf, 
who was recently hit with allegations of sexual assault and abuse by his ex-girlfriend, FKA Twigs. Is that how you pronounce it? Or is there like... Yeah. No, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) She's, yeah, she's the the lovely actress who's in in Honey Boy, which I know you got to see. Yes. Recently. And um, you want to talk about it now? Just go ahead and... Fuck it. Let's talk about it now. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. uh, Not an easy, easy thing, of course, but has to be done. And you certainly can't avoid people you respect just you know you can't avoid people who do stupid shit just because you respect them their craft um shia labeouf is is a dude i uh have kind of been a fan of for you know since i was like eight maybe even younger even stevens let's see when did even steven start i want to say maybe 2001 um so i was like six when i first saw him you know performing on on TV started in 2000, Jesus Christ. Um, and you know, he plays Lewis Stevens and Lewis Stevens is this mischievous, you know, character that has a poster of, you know, um, Kramer from Seinfeld, <laughs> like, uh, you know, his, his hair is all up and everything. It's, it's a classic picture of Kramer and, you know, he has, SNL tapes lined up on his, you know, shelf and whatnot. I fell in love with this character like immediately. And the show's show's pretty funny. And of course he's in, you know, the Transformer flicks and Disturbia surfs up, has a huge 2007 with Transformers Disturbia and surfs up all in the same year and kind of starts to explode. At that point, he's 22 years old and, um, you know, has his issues with, um, gets arrested at one point for public intoxication uh, and, you know, his career continues and kind of has a weird phase there where he's not really, you know, he's in the Indiana Jones movie that nobody really likes. He's an Eagle eye, which nobody really talks about. He's in the wall street money never sleeps. Uh, And, and, you know, he's has issues here where people don't really like to work with him. Don't want to be around him. And, this continues throughout his, his, his whole life, really, up until now. And I would say somewhere in 2012, 2013, he really started to kind of push himself creatively, I would say. And he, he joins this art group, this performance art group uh, called, I don't know how to pronounce one guy's name, but it's, it's LaBeouf, Turner, and I think his name is Aronco. I think that's how you say it. I'm not sure. They do this performance art, very bizarre things. It's 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 part of the thing that he did when he had the bag over his head. Do you remember that? It's yeah. part of that whole yeah that whole thing. Um, and that was when he was, um, I think he was doing that one for Charlie Countryman. He was he was out doing that shit in Europe and stuff and all over the United States. I, I would put a bag over his head and said, "I'm not famous anymore." That was part of part of his deal. So busy guy, right? Doing all kinds of all kinds of stuff. And but his film career, I think, takes a turn and my fandom comes, you know, I, I, I become a big, big fan of his, you know, when I'm 17 in 2012, lawless comes out and he acts alongside Tom Hardy and Jessica Chastain. And I, I really, really dug that role. I thought he did a damn good job. Uh, and then he does Charlie countryman, a movie that I think has some good moments. So it's not a great flick, but then he's in fury in 2014. I like that movie. 2016 he's an American honey. I love that movie. Uh, 2017, Borg vs. McEnroe. I love that movie. 2019, Honey Boy and the Peanut Butter Falcon. Love both of those. You know, they start stacking up, you know, start adding up. You're like, man, I really like what this guy brings. And, and you know, you confront all these things that have happened. He's been arrested. There's been allegations about him being abusive in relationships and this and that. And, and then, of course, just just last month, um, FKA Twigs, who he was dating for about a year, she comes out and, you know, she's going to, she's suing him. Uh, yes, dated from 2018 to 2019. Uh, she's suing him for sexual battery assault and infliction of emotional distress. In his response, LaBeouf stated that he had been abusive to himself and those around him for years and that he has been ashamed and sorry to those he has hurt. So a very generic response, very generic apology. Uh, obviously, f- 
still, this is like a month ago. So they're still figuring out what all is going to, what all is going to go down. And uh, then a movie comes out <laughs> that he's in pieces of a woman, uh, the movie that we're going to be talking about here. So there's no point in running from or avoiding a discussion about someone who's in this movie who uh, probably doesn't really deserve this spot in this movie, you know, who doesn't deserve to be acting alongside someone like Vanessa Kirby, who probably doesn't deserve a spot like this over someone like Jimmy Fails, uh, who, who's also in, in the film, but not as, uh, not as much, a more minor character. Shia LaBeouf probably shouldn't be able to get these roles. These things are adding up. This guy should probably be in, in prison, shouldn't he? What's going on? You look at his resume off screen, and it's not, not good. It's horrible. It's not just this thing that happened. It's not just these allegations from FKA Twigs. It's, you, you go on, just go on, you know, search Shia LaBeouf legal issues and stuff will come up. Lots of stuff. And it's not, not excusable at all. There's nothing, there's nothing there to say, oh, well, you, you know, but he's good in the movies. Yeah, yeah, he's good. So what? You know? And I'm a fan of this guy's, this guy's work. A huge fan. And what he, what he did in Peanut Butter Falcon almost, almost makes me so angry because I thought he had turned that shit around, you know? I genuinely did. And I, I'm, I'm an idiot. You know, I'm a moron and I'm willing to admit it. I'm willing to put myself out there and, you know, I shouldn't be a fan of his. I know this. I know this. I'm not, I'm not going to avoid these, all of these things that add up, you know, against him. It sucks. It's terrible. And it's horrible for these people that he's worked with. Uh, more stories have come out. He was working with Olivia Wilde on a uh on a, a music video and there's emails that go back and forth and i'll just say one of the quotes that, that was in one of the emails that shia labeouf sent to olivia wilde director of book smart said that great jazz musicians know when not to play and she responded i'm out so you know there's things that have happened recently and and, and not just recently but for his entire you know 35 year life that have been tough for him that have been hard on him um, but there's just no excuse, man. There's no excuse. This stuff starts adding up and it's very, very frustrating and it makes it very hard for people to want to watch this movie, right? Pieces of a woman. Um, and it makes his character in the film that much darker at times. Uh, but the man, the man can, can act. He can, he really can. And it, it's just, a. Uh, very very shameful when we watch a film and we we want these artists to like at least come on at least be a decent human being so we can support your fucking art and he he just does not he doesn't make that easy or possible at all yeah you're right you're right he's he's proven time and again that he i think at his core is is really a piece of shit Keeps keeps doing it, man. 35 years old now. Yeah. Yeah. There's no excuse at this point. I mean, Honey Boy showed why. He's, you know, he had a troubled upbringing. He had, you know, substance abuse and mental health issues in the past. But at some point, you need to take responsibility for your actions and grow. You need to, to do better. You need to try. And he hasn't at all. He seems to have blanketed himself in this. Well, I had issues. So, it's not my fault, but no spousal abuse and all spousal abuse, but like sexual abuse, sexual assault like this, this is not, you know, drunk and disorderly. This is, this is really bad shit. That's going to end his career. Yes. And I kind of think he, yeah, he deserves it. I think it's time to say goodbye to Shia LaBeouf. I, 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 in a way I do too. And you don't ever want to, you know, just straight up give up on a human being, but it is not, as the audience and as people who just watch this stuff and consume this stuff, this, it's not our place to just put up with that. We don't, we don't need to put up with that. Um, you know, you and I are, you and I are, are big on trying to, we try to hold all these people accountable because we're watching all these different things and, you know, 
we don't want to call one guy a piece of shit and then this other guy, you know, you know, we, w- we would like to have the knowledge and yeah. I just, I, I know where, where my heart and brain are, you know, and when I'm watching him work, man, you know, yeah. I feel a certain way. I really, but I, I don't, I don't think, yeah, he should be, he should be able to work in that environment anymore. I really don't. Um, I think it's too dangerous for the people around him and maybe too dangerous for himself. Um, I know he gets, you know, like just sometimes a bit too locked into some of his characters and to acts like yeah. an idiot. And so, you know, you just, you, you, there's, there's no excuse for it. So I just don't think the environment might be right for him. Um, just in this, in the same way that we we brought up how one of the you know most critically acclaimed actors of all time, Dustin Hoffman, back in the seventies, probably shouldn't have been in that environment. Guy was kind of being a piece of shit. Yeah, and and got to call these people out. You know, we we called out. We can call call out people on Oscar Sunday. We'll do it here on Sneak Preview in real time because he's in this film, right? He is the second build guy, you know, he's the, he's the, he's the dad in this movie, you know? So it's a very important character and he gives a very good performance, but that probably should be it. Yeah. Well, we look at, you know, you look at Hollywood and there's certain things that for some reason are forgivable in the Hollywood scene abuse is one of those things or at least it has been in the past i mean look at i think the biggest example of this is sean penn yeah famously in the 90s beat the old the holy shit out of madonna and goes on to win two oscars and become yeah claimed actors in hollywood mel gibson has done horrific she has said just horrible shit about jewish people he said horrible things about black people he said horrible things about women but free pass. So I think a lot of it is timing because Shia LaBeouf did this in an age where we are no longer just looking the other way. Yes. But do you think that this means we need to go back and hold Mel Gibson and Sean Penn accountable for the shit they did and said and ax their careers as well? What do you think? I, I, if in real time, I, I quite frankly wish, yeah, I, w- I definitely wish that Sean Penn's career would have gone differently. Do I, do I respect as a, a 25 year old dude who, you know, had, had no knowledge and, you know, Oh man, tree of life. Oh man, you know, and mystic river. Oh man. And this guy's awesome. And then you learn that and you're like, Oh shit. You know, it's a whole different relationship to it. Yeah. But had I learned this as I was, you know, in, if I was in my twenties in the nineties, when this happened with Sean Penn, I really would hope that I would not want his career to continue. I would hope you could but go it back. Is, it, it is a different day and age. I mean, obviously you're right. You know, the whole world is watching and, and every, you know, I mean, Twitter, just Twitter, you know, people can video anything. Everything you do is recorded and everything you do is documented and you can't get away with anything. And that, that's a good, you know, it's a good and bad thing. It's very scary, but it's also like, yeah, you, it's good that, you know, especially our the celebrities and, you know, athletes and, and folks, you know, actors, whatever, what have you, it's good that we hold them accountable. We want them to be good examples. Of course. Yeah. Just because you're very good at transforming into another person and delivering a fantastic performance does not give you a free pass to beat the shit out of your girlfriend. Yeah. Because I can't do that. I don't want to do that. So you shouldn't either. You know, it's just simple. Yeah. Simple common sense. Yeah. It is, you know, it's a whole idea of, you know, how like being famous makes a lot of people just, you know, either oblivious to the law or impervious to it. Yeah. And I do agree that we got to hold that shit accountable as far as ending their careers. I don't know about that because, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, like, especially Sean Penn, Sean Penn's such an interesting, interesting one, but like Kevin Spacey has been canceled basically. Yeah. Louis CK has been canceled. Uh, who else do you think anyone else is, is in that has oh. actually been just removed? 
Well, Cosby's in prison, so I would say him. Oh yeah, he's yeah, and uh, Weinstein, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, because you can go all the way back to classic Hollywood. You know, Bing Crosby openly beat the shit out of his kids. Charlie Chaplin was a crazy control freak when it came to his relationships. He was not even a monster. So what do we do in this situation? Like, I, I think that you have to, you know, as we've said many times, separate the men from the work, but also with yes. current people, I think you do have to give them the chance to explain themselves and try to somehow give them a second chance. In, in some cases, like in the case of like Kevin Spacey, that guy's a monster and he needs to be put in prison. But I think, you know, I don't know. I just think it's it's not fair to condemn people. First off, without a trial. That's important. And second off. I, I, don't, I don't know. This, we always come up. We always come back to these super difficult super to explain deep. concepts. <laughs> I'm trying that's to great. Yeah. No, that no that that's 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 it though is is allowing things to be on the table and still watching the movie. You know, you and I you and I sat through the two whole two hours and we know we know what we know about Shia LaBeouf. Yeah. We know what we know about Dustin Hoffman. We praised Kramer versus Kramer. We know what we know about Roman Polanski. We praised Chinatown. We we know we know the difference between talking about figures, individuals, role models, you know, these people that are supposed to be role models. Right. And then separating work from person. Uh, I, I like to call it on screen and off screen, you know, inside that two hour cut there when I'm watching the movie, there's no need for what Vanessa Kirby is doing to be affected by what Shia LaBeouf has done off the screen. Yeah. I agree. No with need. That. Yeah. No need for that. There's no need for Ellen Burstyn to have to pay, and for people to not watch the movie because of what Shia, another actor, has done off the screen. Yes. There's nothing to do with pieces of a woman. Nothing to do with it. But I also think if we're going to do a, an episode on the film and that guy is in it, or this guy directed it, or or whatever it is, I think it needs to be brought up. And I think, I think especially when we're talking about white dude in his 30s and you and I are two young white guys, I definitely think it needs to be brought up. I think these are the things you can't avoid anymore. Like you said, we're all watching you know, these things. We're holding people accountable. These are the conversations that we're going to bring up now. You can't just get away with it. We're going to call you out. Um, it's very gray, man, of course, because you, like you said, you can bring up different examples from the past. Do you, do you annex them? Do you get rid of Sean Penn's entire post-1995? I, I, it's hard. It's very, very difficult. But I know that Shia LaBeouf right now should probably not be working in these kinds of environments. It's, he's making it unsafe for some people. Yes. But do you think that these people, these people who do these heinous things, they, you know, spousal abuse, do you think they deserve to be completely shut away or do you think that they deserve an opportunity to make amends and try to have a second chance? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, earlier I said, uh, something I heard on, on a video one time was they just like never give up on a human being. And like right now, Shia, no, but w could there be a time later in his life or five, 10 years from now where he is, much more in control of his thoughts and more in control of his actions and can be on a set and not act like a total dick and be an ego freak, then yeah, man, I would, because I think he's genuinely a great actor. I think he has an, I think he has a, an amazing charisma to add to any movie. I think he's going to benefit any movie he's in. Honestly, I think he's that kind of an actor and it's a shame to see a guy like that in his thirties. So I, I, yes, to answer your question. Yes. I think someone like, Shia is a great example because he's literally in his what should be his prime. And I think the peanut butter Falcon is his best performance ever. And that's just, that's just about a year ago. I, I think he should get a second chance 
but we, we you and i like or no one's to decide that except for him like he's he he's the one who has to like make all these like big changes and improve a lot of people wrong um it's really on him you know at this point i think yeah. i think it's on any of those guys yeah. to kind of resurrect their career you, you have to kind of bring yourself back to life someone like shia is in a much better place than someone like louis ck because of age so I, yes man i think it's possible but right now i just the guy just shouldn't be in movies right now. Well, and I think it does take a certain amount of self-awareness. I think you need to accept, I am not a god on this movie set. I am not untouchable. I am an asshole. I need to fix this. And yes. that is something that so many people in Hollywood just do not have. They do not have self-awareness. They do not realize they've done something wrong or they don't give a shit. And that's overcoming that is probably the most impossible thing for these people. That's why we, you know, he gave that half-assed apology because in his mindset, his ego took control and is like, fuck it. I'll get over this. I got over everything else. What's this? So if these guys deserve a second chance, they have to first admit that they're in a bad place. They've done bad shit. They need to step back, make themselves better and then start from the ground up. Yeah. And, and then, and yeah, then contribute legitimate stuff to film yeah yeah which i think shia has done and could do in the future just yeah just not right now uh piece of a woman his his role in that is is something to behold though I, and it as he there i think there's a moment in the film with him where you're like whoa was that symbolic of like you know there he goes pretty wild yeah yeah and I do want to clarify, I am talking here about specific cases like Shia LaBeouf, Sean Penn, Mel Gibson, these guys who have been accused of doing things, have not, you know, it hasn't been confirmed in a court, but they've also, let me just, all right, in, let me just clarify entirely what I'm saying here. In terms of Roman Polanski and Kevin Spacey, if you rape kids, you deserve to burn, regardless of where you are. In yeah, your you should be in prison. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. These guys, I'm willing to see if they're willing to, be better and make amends for their shit yeah yeah oh yeah there's a, certainly a, yeah uh, there's certainly like unspoken tears <laughs> to, every case is different yeah exactly it, it, it is gray in some situations in some situations it's not yeah yeah for sure <laughs> <laughs> no doubt yeah roman plansky should have been been in prison he should be in prison now for what over 40 years yeah yes indeed oh well, I'm glad we got that out of the way. There was no way we were going to be able to do this episode without bringing. No, it no, you, no, you can't. But it also can't take away from what everybody else is doing. That's amazing in this movie, and that this movie should be seen by people just alone for what fucking Vanessa Kirby is doing. Jesus Christ, give her the Oscar already. <laughs> Let's get into them. Let's talk about the, the filmmakers here. So, some of Hungarian director Cornel Mondrusko's other films include Jupiter's Moon. White God, Tender Son, The Frankenstein Projects, Delta, Johanna, Pleasant Days, and This I Wish and Nothing More. So a lot of uh, very indie films. I haven't heard of any of these. Uh, White God. White God is, is the one. That's the one that, um, if you want to watch one of the ones that these people have made, that's, that's the business right there. Hungary, beautiful country. I've actually gotten to go there a few times, you know, because I lived in Romania. They're right next to each other. Um, you, you forget that, uh, every country has great, great movies to offer. And these, these are the people, uh, at the top of the list here. <laughs> That's cool. I love that you have some familiarity with these, with these guys. That's great. Yeah. Another, you know, piece of woman. Another reason why is like, I don't, I don't, I don't need the, uh, trailer quite, you know, cause this is, the, it's good enough what I know they've done and who they are and knowing that they have a connection as a writer and director and partnership and in real life, you know, so. Yeah. It's cool. Um, screenwriter Kata Weber's other writing projects include White God and Jupiter's Moon. So they've been working together for a few years now. Yeah, yeah. Vanessa Kirby plays Martha. She is a talented up-and-comer who became a budding A-lister after her back-to-back -back appearances in Mission Impossible Fallout and Fast and Furious Presents Hobbs and Shaw. So she's kind of becoming an action star, which is odd considering her role in this. Like, she's she's experimenting, and I like that. Oh yeah, this is a great way to set up set up a long, long career. She's she's gonna be around this one. 
she's very special. I don't think there's very many people who can, who can go from what's happening in hour one to our, you know, to last, last minute of this film piece of woman. I don't think there's a lot of people who can do that right now. Yeah, definitely. Um, Vanessa Kirby also portrays princess Margaret on Netflix's the crown and has appeared in such films as about time me before you Everest and Jupiter ascending. She's set to appear in mission impossible seven and eight, both currently filming. And yeah, I'm sensing some pop, some awards, uh, attention for this film. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think she's like lights out, carries this movie. <laughs> she's so good. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know, man. I, when you, you watch a, uh, a, a woman do a, do a scene where she's, she's pregnant. It's an actual scene, like an actual prolonged scene. And she's showing what it's like to be pregnant. And ah, man, just that's yeah, that's not easy stuff. She's, she's pretty much perfect at it. So I, I love everything she's doing. This Def, definitely what I think should, 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 I think she should win best actress. I have not seen no mad land. Uh, but I, I, yeah, she's like unbelievable in this movie. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I'm uh I'm I was surprised because I don't I'd only seen her in action films, so I didn't know she had this in her. And yeah. God damn. <laughs> Oof. Um, just the way she says fuck, you know, even if it's under her breath, man, you just every syllable you feel, you feel every little thing she's she's saying, she's doing, she's like and and she has a way of uh looking like looking like some people I've like seen or met a few times. And ah, God, I love when someone can do that. I love when someone can capture this authenticity of real life people that I've come across at some point. And Vanessa Kirby has, has it that exact thing, you you know, you want. No, I I'm with you. I had no idea. I had no idea. It was, it was right there. She has this, this seething pain and hate just bubbling right under the surface at all times and it's you get it you understand why somebody would feel that and it's it's hard to to blame somebody for something like this and she you can tell the whole movie she's struggling with who to blame and god damn yeah it just it feels real like you can feel that this definitely some of it at least happened to to the writer and director here it's this came from somewhere real. Yeah. Or, 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 or it's somewhere that they could have gone, you know? Yeah. Like, um, you know, I've been, you know, I have a near two year old daughter and I've been, you know, right next to, you know, I was right next to my girlfriend when I was holding her leg when she was giving birth and what, those moments like those moments i can't imagine the the kind of well first off the anticipation like when you know it's happening and then you know it's time to time to like go to work and you're kind of like just there's nowhere else to be but right there time kind of stops i I don't i don't know if people are gonna respect that first 30 minutes enough of this movie they're, they're really putting themselves on the line for, for art's sake, for movie's sake, for film's sake. And I, I was like shattered when the, the title card came up. I was sh- just gone. I was done. I was like, I can't, I don't, I don't know if I can continue this. This is brutal, like brutality. And it was like, this is, this is like Terrence Malick level, like st- stuff going on here this is like gorgeous cinematography and directing and when you break down just what it is and you know like you said you these these two the writer and director that this is something that they've sort of gone through you totally can feel it because yeah they're putting their hearts on the line they're putting an experience on the line i i have i can't compare my experience to theirs because it was totally different of course but I can't even fathom putting my own experience on the line. And mine was full of joy. 
to put that experience on the line when it's the most, you know, dark thing that you can go through. That's like, that's what filmmaking is fucking for. This is why, this is, this is like why the medium is there for, for people to tell these stories and be like, Hey, it's, it's okay to go through shit. You're going to. And I, I very much appreciate when a movie puts itself just wears its heart on its sleeve and is not afraid to be like, this is, this is what the story is. We are not going to be, we are not going to try to be funny here. We are not going to try to cute it up or give you any fucking release. We are not giving you that. I, I, I love that. I respect the shit out of that because then you, you get this, you get a product that's like, Whoa, man, like, that must have happened because that was too real, you know? And I, these, these people have my attention, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's like Calvin candy says <laughs> in Django, you had me curiosity, you know, it's, tr- it's true. They really, they really, they have me by the balls. Now I'm, I'm willing to watch really anything they've done. So, uh, and I'm certainly going to go back and rewatch white God. Uh, this, this is, this is incredible filmmaking stuff. That's not, not a lot of people want to do because nobody wants to go there in their mind. <laughs> Why would you? It's easy. It's not easy. You know, yeah. it's, it's fucking, it's fucking hard to process that and then to put it on paper and then to put it on a screen for you and I to talk about here and for people to enjoy and to relate to, to maybe learn, maybe get some perspective, maybe learn about how hard it is to be a fucking woman. You know, I think a lot of people would benefit from watching this movie just for that reason. Uh, special stuff, man. I think, I think, I think we got some filmmakers on the rise here. Yeah. And that's what this show is all about is finding the people who are on the rise, looking at the people to be, you know, to look out for next year, the people who are going to make waves and not just, you know, writers and directors, but actors like Vanessa Kirby who are going to be huge in the next 10 years of Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And, you know, I think we couldn't have asked for a better film to start this out. The more I think about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's tough, you know, of course, with the 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 shy news that just came out last month, but but at the same time, it, it just there's so much amazing stuff happening here. Uh Jimmy Fails and Benny Safty are both in this movie. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Fails is is uh the, the star of Last Black Man in San Francisco, came out at the beginning of 2019, just a ugh, mind melter kind of movie. And Benny Safty, brother of Josh Safty, those are the guys who fucking directed Uncut Jams and Good Time, you know? So those people are in this movie, you know? Clearly they like what's going on in Hungary. <laughs> and, and then um, Ellen Burstyn. Yeah, Ellen Burstyn. What's, you know, this is a, this is a two, t- uh, one Oscar? Ellen yeah, Burstyn? Just one. just one. Just one, yeah, just the one. Uh, of course, you know, if you've listened to, you know, our, our film guys and podcasts and, you know, the exorcist is obviously something we've talked about and brought up a bunch, <laughs> you know, so she's been in our life without us really knowing who she was before we even, you know, put it all together. And, and to see her in something like this alongside, you know, she, I think, I think Ellen's 83 and, you know, she's acting alongside Vanessa Kirby. It is uh, quite special to see that see that stuff unfold um <laughs> I, I couldn't believe there are some scenes or B- bursting can just turn it on within seconds it's not it's just like it's kind of the back of her hand type type shit you know Dude. it's she just does it in her sleep <laughs> she's 88 88 ellen burston is 80. 88 years old oh man yeah 83 i was five years off this 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 woman has says dedicated you know dedicated her life to to the craft and, and is still kind of blowing our minds you know still today so she she's great in this I, I i anticipate she'll be up for best supporting actors partly because she's ellen burston <laughs> <laughs> but she is very good in it you know she she is she's awesome well and i've heard she's the front runner because her her performance is very subdued but it's also extremely manipulative and sick at times like you could argue she's the bad guy Oh, she definitely, she definitely is. She, she manipulates both of them. Yeah. yeah. 
It's fucked up, but I believe it. Ellen Burstyn is great at playing very powerful and kind of like subdued characters, like in the background, you know, kind of like uh, the character you you don't know you're supposed to be paying attention to. That's oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I think she's perfect for the Northeast. Perfect where she can wear a lot of layers and a couple long necklaces. That's that's where Ellen Burstyn lives, and she definitely she has a she has like a acceleration. You know, I think I think some actresses have like a, a really high sprint speed where they can just boom go. I I, I think uh, the acceleration, the ability to just kind of turn on a dime, like you said, be subdued and then boom, kind of yell in your face like for a split second. She just kind of pierces you, and I yeah I. I like love what she does in most of the movies I've seen her in. And she's someone that I know I'm going to be watching more of as I, you know, watch more old films and watch more Oscar nominated films. She's just going to pop up more and more and more. And I I'm, I'm excited for that, man. I she's, she's a lady. I am always okay with when she's in a flick. (laughs) I'm, I think I'm most impressed by the fact that she's 88 years old and can keep up with these long continuous takes in this film. Yeah, that's impressive. Like she's not missed a beat. You know, she's still she's Academy Award winner Ellen Burstyn, regardless of how old she gets. That's who she is. Uh, She won her Oscar for 1974's Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Yes. Um, She's also been nominated for performances in The Last Picture Show, The Exorcist, Same Time Next Year, Resurrection and Requiem for a Dream. Yeah, Uh, I couldn't remember if she she won for Requiem because that was best supporting, right? That was best actress. She lost to Julia. Oh, it was. Oh, duh. Aaron Brockovich. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-mm. I haven't seen Aaron, Aaron Brockovich, Brockovich. Is all right. But I can tell you, Ellen Burstyn deserved it for Requiem for a Dream. That that role, that movie is unreal. Movie's wild. I, I Aaron Brockovich is all right. But yeah, I'm with you. Um, neat bit of trivia. Ellen Burstyn was also the uncredited voice of Francis Dollarhide's psychotic grandma in Red Dragon. Oh. The yes. bit where he's lifting weights and you just hear him talking to his grandma as a child and she's like, you filthy little bastard. Like that whole bit. That's Ellen That's Burstyn Ellen. for no reason. <laughs> Good. Good. I did not know that. That's so cool. I uh, I used to get Ellen Burstyn and Judy Dench mixed up when I was a young, young kid. I used to get Dustin Hoffman and Gene Hackman mixed up. Oh. I used to get Dustin Hoffman and Richard Gere mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, because their hair, they have that like kind of part, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Way different ages, though. I got Hackman and Hoffman mixed up because they had similar names, or at least I thought so as a kid. Hackman and Hoffman, yeah. As a kid, I wasn't seeing any films that either of them were in. So I just no. knew the names. <laughs> yeah. Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. They're the same guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love funny. that. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I definitely did that a lot as a kid. I just assumed, you know, certain things like Daniel Day Lewis. Like even even when I was like twelve, like There Will Be Blood came out, I just was like, I thought this guy just wasn't in anything, you know. I was like, oh, this actor just came out of the blue, you know, sort of thing. It's like, no, he he has this really long, amazing career. <laughs> <laughs> you idiot, twelve year old. <laughs> funny, like knowing where we are now and looking back, like before it all happened, where we're like we barely knew anything. It's funny <laughs> when we were when we were mirrored. Uh, just thoughts yeah nothing <laughs> nothing was there <laughs> that's awesome um let's talk a bit about um comedian eliza sledginger who's uh in this film she plays martha's concerned sister anita uh sledginger is a hilarious stand-up comic whose comedy specials include war paint freezing hot confirmed kills elder millennial and unveiled she's absolutely hilarious and it was odd seeing her in such a dramatic role especially when she's not really known for acting but maybe that's going to change. And uh, have you seen any of her, of her stand-up? Unveiled. That's it. That's the only one. I've seen um, all of them but War Paint, and she's fucking hilarious. I, I think she's awesome. She is, and she's, dare I say, an even better dramatic actress. She, I thought I thought everyone brought, brought their exact you know, spark. And I think the same goes for Sarah Snoop, who's uh, like a star in uh, Succession alongside you know karen Culkin and jeremy strong and those guys over there 
she's wonderful in that show. And I, I think it's really cool to see, to see people just kind of take on something that maybe like, you know, like you said, you're not used to you see so stand up comedy and then bam, it was like when Louis CK was in American hustle. You're like, what the fuck? It's cool. It's cool. I, I like what I like when shit like that happens. Yeah. It's so oddball, but you look at this cast and it's not your typical bunch. It's Vanessa Kirby, no. mostly known for action movies. Shia LaBeouf, who's a fucking train wreck. Ellen Burstyn, who's an Oscar winner. Uh, Benny Safdie, a filmmaker. Uh, Eliza Schlesinger, stand-up comic. Like, who you bring this this bunch together and you like you get this? It's crazy, but they made it work. It's amazing. I think that they clearly knew exactly who they wanted. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It it. There's a reason it moves the way it does and, and works. Uh, I think I think all, all the people are pulling their weight. Let's talk a bit about Molly Parker, who plays um, Ava, the unfortunate midwife. Uh, yes. Parker has big roots in TV, appearing in recurring roles in such shows as Dexter, Deadwood, The Firm, House of Cards, Goliath, and Lost in Space. And she also played the murdered wife in past Filmgasm podcast subject, 1922 alongside Thomas Jane. And uh, God, I just felt horrible for her. The whole movie, just such a horrible situation to find yourself in. And, oh, yeah, we'll get into that. But I thought yeah. she did an amazing job holding it together until that last bit at the courthouse when she just fell apart. Yeah, I think I think Molly Parker is, is doing some some of the best stuff in this movie. Uh, as I, you know, have kind of thought about it more after watching it. I think, I think that character has, you know, obviously the most going against them because of, because of their place, because of their narrative. But I just totally disagree and totally, you know, was rooting for her the whole time. Um, this, like, this is not on her obviously not in her character at all i just couldn't believe that i thought at one point the film was actually going to go on that point where she was going to like have to really 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 pay for this like for the rest of her life and it, you know vanessa kirby um martha rather like looked to, looked at her woman to woman and it's like one of the best moments of the movie and it's you go into you know when you have these situations like it's very hard to speak about her job in the movie it you go into it knowing that that's a possibility right what happens and all parties that are involved know this you know it's a possibility no matter what and when when you're in this situation man it's obviously the last thing that you want to happen when you, you are the person doing this job. And so to see that happen, you know, it's, it's a, a personal tragedy for her. And I think, I think there's a whole nother film that's like from her perspective. And I love when a movie can do that. It makes me that interested in her because, she, because her performance is that good. Molly Parker is that good to where I was, kind of locked in on what she was saying and doing from the moment she walked into the house and started, you know, and that's when, that's when the real directing starts happening when her character shows up and the camera is, boom, you know, moving around the house and she, and she shows up. And I, just, I think, I think Molly Parker is one of the better performances and it uh, gives one of the better performances in the whole movie. I think she's unbelievable. And that character, you know, some people, in the in the movie within the movie look at her as the bad guy but like you said it's really alan burston i was expecting this film to end with her suicide ah man with, the way it felt with, it felt with, was going was just you know the guilt of the entire city calling her a murderer and i figured i thought she was just going to hang herself before the trial like in her cell i'm glad it didn't oh. go that way oh man yeah she that would have been too rough too much yeah think so um so pieces of a woman currently has an imdb score of 7.1 and a certified fresh rotten tomato score of 76 percent it is a netflix original so that's where you will always be able to stream it uh definitely check this out so let's talk about this film in depth 
Uh, whew, so we open on a half hour continuous shot, which is fucking amazing. I am always impressed by that in every film. Continuous shots are my bread and butter. <laughs> um, well, there's is- yeah, yeah, they, yeah, and you you don't know until that happens, you know, like you don't know it's your bread and butter, or you don't know it's going to be the, your favorite part of the movie. But this is certainly the most impressive part of the film is is that first thirty minutes it before the title card. It's pretty mind blowing. From yeah. from 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 the direction of just shy, uh, you know starting to go home from work and the way he's yelling at construction workers. And, and then you go into the house, like, dude, this is like, I was like, I'm in for a ride. You know, I told you, I was like, I can tell I'm going to like this. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Jeez. And it doesn't, you know, I, I actually wanted to ask you about this. So I've never been around a childbirth, not yet, but you have. And I wanted to ask you, is this a realistic depiction of how labor would go down? Fucking A, yeah, yeah, for sure. She Vanessa Kirby, like, you know, and Brianna, my girlfriend, would would tell you is, is like she is nailing every little sound and complaint, you know, and almost like you're like just drunk, almost like you just have no idea, like what do I, what, what what this is terrible, you know? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, and. Again, my girlfriend and I situation way different. You know, we didn't have a home birth. But I, of course, you know, I thought about this. Uh, I thought about these two characters as, you know, they're about to be parents. And I was just thinking about when I first became a parent, how it was like the most, you know, indescribable, you know, moments of my entire life. And again, like watching like a director and writer and people put that onto a movie and these actors portray it. It's just super impressive and can't go, you know, can't go understated how, how, how incredible the, the opening, the opening 30 minutes is the, the shot, the banter between Martha and Sean, when she's like, distract me, tell me a joke. And he's like, what kind of music does broccoli like? She's like, what? Brock and roll. <laughs> you know, she's like, whoa, fuck. This is like really good writing. Really good. Knows when to take it up to, you know, up to the next level. Knows when to take it down to something that a normal person would say like that. Something like a character like Sean would say. And, you know, Shia sells it and Vanessa's selling it the whole time. And he's like, come on, let's get on this ball. You know, let's get on this ball. And she's like, fuck that ball. <laughs> you know, I I totally remember not just like those very leading up moments, but I remember there, there's times where Brianna's just, my girlfriend, Brianna was going through just pain during her pregnancy. And, you know, there's times where you just, you do have to just be like, fuck, you know? And I've never experienced anything like that just happen to me because there's a human growing inside of me. And, of course, it gives you this like tremendous amount of respect that you already should have had for women, but it gives you an even deeper one that you, you, you just, you, 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 you know, our gender is just not as good. <laughs> <laughs> our gender is not as strong. We, we just cannot do things that uh, females do. And the most impressive one is carrying a fucking child. And um, yeah, I just, they definitely nail it. And I think Vanessa Kirby deserves all the acclaim and awards that someone can get because of what she's doing in that opening 30 minutes. And then some, then she keeps going. That's what, that's what I was impressed with though. Connor was like how awesome the first 30 minutes were and how, how shattered I was as far as filmmaking goes, it's just incredible stuff, but I was broken, you know, but then she, she keeps going. She keeps acting and this character keeps moving, keeps going with her life, keeps going to work, goes to a couple of parties, deals with Sean, this dickhead boyfriend, you know, and just continues to, to act her ass off Vanessa Kirby. And I, I, I think that's incredible for her to open up in that scene and then and just keep going, you know, keep going with this, this two hour movie. And she's the reason it's interesting the whole time. I agree. I agree. I have some, I have some things to say about Sean. 
I um, yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah, he's not a, not a cool guy yeah, at times. True. But I think the film forgets that he lost his kid too. And I think that we don't really get an opportunity to see Sean process his grief. And I would have liked to have seen that. I would have liked to have seen a reconciliation of sorts, a, you know, one year later, you know, how are you doing kind of thing? Cause I get the vibe that Sean's going to go like OD in Seattle. <laughs> like this is the end of his life. And I would have liked to have had a little bit more of like, maybe he's going to be okay. I don't know. Okay. I feel you there. I feel you. And I think typically I think that's what we want and that's what, what movies would give us. But I think, I think it's our, I, I think it's in the title. I think pieces of a woman. I think this movie by not showing anything with Sean and showing the ending that they do show, which is just, the most gorgeous tree I've ever seen in my life. The, the decision to do that, to, to stick to her perspective, to the woman's perspective, it, it's like a big deal for the movie, I think. Do I want closure for Sean? Damn, yeah, I do. Hell yeah, I do. Because I was with you. I was like, what the fuck? Why? This guy's going to go to like to Seattle? He's going to go to Washington State where... I mean, a place that is known for the suicide rate being like through the roof. And this is something that you and I were like, oh yeah, this character is dark and going on a dark path. We don't, we want, come on. We want him to, we want him to reconcile with the fact that, yeah, he has to process that he lost a child. Clearly he was depressed, clearly. So I, I, I definitely feel you on that. It's, it's very difficult, especially being a dude. You're like, oh fuck. Like if I was in that spot, I want... I, like I would want some kind of closure or some kind of, but it, it's almost like it's from her perspective. I, I definitely battled with that. That's one of the, the things I've thought about a lot, you know, since watching it was just kind of the, the narrative of both characters. I agree with you that the film is from her, from her perspective, but the problem is it gives us many scenes solely from Sean's perspective. That's why I was expecting his side of the story to be finished off too. Cause they were kind of leading up to that. We got to see, you know, him, his whole uh, affair with the with the lawyer, yeah, and, you know, lashing out at work and little things like that. Felt like we were getting, we were going to get his half, and I would love to see his half. I don't think the movie's incomplete without it. I just would have liked to have seen that, but I do agree that this is mostly her journey to self acceptance and closure. But you know, yeah. I, like, I like, I like a nice, I like a neatly tied bow at the end of my, my films. I, yeah, you know me, I don't, I, I want, I want the, I want the slap to hurt. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I think a movie we've talked about recently was if Beale Street could talk, I think that ending was like a bailout. That's not how the book ends. And I don't, and that's also, not, and I know that's a whole different conversation between the book and, and whatnot. But I, I think like if you stick to your guns sometimes and, and make it hard, and make it like tough. I think that's I think that's I think that's like really effective. I think it can stand out, and I think that's one of the things that probably stands out for me is that Shia's character, Sean. Literally, we just see him walk away, and that's it. You know, and he's gonna get on a plane and, and go to go to Seattle, go to Washington, and that was that was wild, especially with what we know about him off screen. Is like. Was that it? Was that him walking off? You know, was that Shia? That's it. That's me. That was his last. Was that maybe his last scene for a little bit? Who knows? Uh, but I, yeah, I, I definitely understand you, man. But just on a performance standpoint, what'd you think of, or in a character standpoint, what'd you think of Sean? Like, did you think it was an interesting character? Uh, what'd you think about him? I thought it was a very interesting character. I like that he's kind of set up to be kind of a goofy boyfriend who's, you know, there to help. But after all this happens, he's emotionally shattered to the point of pure rage and it just destroys him. And you get it. I mean, the drugs and going back to drinking and just, he's, he's completely spiraled out of control. But unlike uh, Martha, we don't get to see him reclaim his life. 
We don't get to see. In fact, it's kind of implied he never will. It's implied that by taking the money and fucking off to Seattle, he's done. He's resigning culpability. He's resigning responsibility. He's just like, it can't get better, so fuck it. And that is kind of his whole story in this movie is it can't get better. Whereas with Martha, it's maybe it can get better. It's not going to be whole, but it can, you can fix something. Yeah, there's still hope. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's, you know, the more I talk about it, the more, the more I think it works. It, I, I, it, this movie totally worked for me. It, it's, you know, like it can be kind of like frustrating to think about, but I like when movies do that. And I like when movies give you conversations like this that are not like, oh, which bad guy should have, you know, done this? You know, it's like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, this is like, this is honest. This is really honest. And you're really getting like the core of like who you are as a, as a person, and as, especially as a movie fan, you know, and, and when you kind of, Watch a movie like Piece of Woman. It just does not allow you to to take it lightly or or for it to be easy. You're going to have to kind of mull it over and think about it and be like, "Fuck, was that the right decision filmmaking wise, or or or, or is that even what I should be paying attention to? Should I just be paying attention to Martha and what she's going through?" And I'm, you know, it's a lot at once, and it's, that's awesome. I like when that happens. I've, I've, I felt I felt very similarly the feelings I had after when this movie ended. Felt very similarly when Waves ended. I was just like, shit. Just like, shit. I got a lot to think about. A lot of stuff to think about. Got to, like, mull over this movie. <laughs> you know? Well, you know what's interesting about these three films that you've kind of connected is, you know, Pieces of a Woman, Waves, and Beale Street. They're all films about real people dealing with very, very, very real shit. And I think that's really, you know, at the core of it, that's the shit that is worth talking about it's stuff we try to comprehend as part of somebody else's life and stuff that people go through regrettably but it does happen you know no one's gathering all six infinity stones and taking on thanos that's not happening <laughs> but but, uh, yeah. but people people lose their children every day yeah it's every fucking horrifying day. it's yeah. stuff that you know, people can use to kind of help themselves find a silver lining in a way, so find some kind of semblance of hope. That's what I th- I'd like to think that. Oh man, yeah, and and you need both. You need both to coexist. You need those. You need those infinity stones so we can so we can go places and explore different worlds. And then we need to be sucked back down to earth by a movie like Pieces of a Woman. Be like, hey. That's not all movie making is for. Sometimes it needs to speak to you, speak to who you are at your core. I love, I love when you can accept both. I love that. And not a lot of people do. That's the weird thing. A lot of people no, no. throw one of those away and say like, oh, it's shit. It's not my style. But it's like an identity thing, right? Yeah. Like you, you, have, you have to like this kind of stuff because this is, this is who you are or whatever. I just, it's not for me. Um, if I like it, I like it. And I think, I think we got a film here. I think piece of woman, I think is a real film. <laughs> you made a real film. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I, I you know, these, these Hungarian folks have our attention. They really do. And this is what, what it's all about. What you just said, echo, what you just said is about having these conversations and finding out about these artists and watching more, watching more of their shit. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Um, are there any other scenes in this movie you want to highlight? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, uh, you know, obviously we've, we've, you know, there's the, the big 30 minute thing at the beginning and I, I, you know, there's stuff throughout it. It very much reminded me of like a Todd field movie, like, you know, like in the bedroom where it's like, man, you just, every scene is worth it here. <laughs> you're kind of like, you're not skipping anything here. Everything is, is, has a point. Everything is, is honest, authentic and something that I would love to point out that I think is like a really good attribute to, to this, the screenplay here is the scene when, you know, pretty much all of our cast is together and we have a conversation between Sean, 
uh, Shia's character and then uh, Benny Safdie's character is there, Chris, and they're talking about the white stripes. And, you know, <laughs> this is this is where Shia, like, like shines and it should it like it sh- looks like he's born to do this stuff he's you know going back and forth with benny safty and they're like oh yeah man what they they were like you know they're like brother and sister or whatever they're posing as brother and sister but they're really married yeah what one of the jack white and meg and you know they're doing that whole bit and and martha uh vanessa's kirby's you know she's like oh, i don't i don't know what you're talking about and or no it's sarah snook sorry sarah snook's character is uh is like what are you talking about and they're like Shia, Shia LaBeouf, uh, Sean is like 2001, 2002. Like, where the hell were you at? Living under a rock? <laughs> you know, like, there's some stuff happening in that those moments before it gets really, really real. It's like, damn, this is like, I've had these conversations. Yeah. What the fuck? Like, I've had these conversations at family things where, like, there is a cousin who just doesn't know shit you know, doesn't know anything about movies or TV or, or like music or something, you know, pop culture. And they're like, what white stripes, what? And you, you have to explain it to them. And I, I was blown away. I was really, really blown away by, by some of that stuff for these people to be Hungarian. They, they knew how to write some American stuff really well. <laughs> um, I, I, I really liked that bit. And then it leads up into uh, Vanessa Kirby one of her finer moments in the film when she gets to tell her mom, like, fuck off, you know, uh, very, very powerful bit of screenplay writing there and just awesome acting from both of them. Um, and, and then that's, you know, then you have Sean, you have Sean again, who's just kind of looking out the window and that's when Ellen Burstyn's like, Hey, get the hell out of here. I'll give you this money. So that whole, that whole stretch is like just incredible filmmaking. It's really funny, really honest, you know, like, almost kind of dramedy style there for a minute. And then it just hits you right in the heart. And I, I, I like that, that, that stretch a lot. And I'd like to point out another gorgeous continuous shot. Yes, yes, yes. Inside the house. Yeah. Yes. The bit with the white stripes I had in my talking points and actually forgot to bring it up. So very, very cool. <laughs> I, I love when that stuff happens so much, so much. I love when, things that are just it feels so accessible when they're kind of when they're going uh when shia goes oh wichita he kind of just sings that that line real quick i'm like that was so real i know guys who do that at parties i know guys like sean you know i know guys like that fuck (laughs) damn it he's he was he was crazy good in those moments shia is i don't think he realizes how good he is at working with other people in these in these scenes dude you're good at it you're you're really good at playing off of people and doing doing those things funny things serious things you know and kind of changing your tone penny for your thoughts you know god he's good at that god damn dude ah, it's frustrating frustrating i think this was his best chance yet at an oscar nomination and because of the shit he's done I feel like it has it. It could torpedo the whole movie's chances at award season. I I I do think Vanessa Kirby is is definitely getting that getting that uh nomination, but but maybe nothing else. Maybe I I would love to see a screenplay nod or a directing nod. I think I think there's just terrific stuff going on on both of those those fronts. Cinematography, my man. Cinematography. Oof, oof, editing. Hmm. Yeah, the, the this movie's a it's a technical gem. Yeah. It really is is not what I, you know, going in, I was kind of expecting a half-ass drama. I was not hearing very good things, but my God, I, I was, yeah, mesmerized. Very well done film. Um, yeah. So where do you rate it? Oh, I give it, an, I give it an eight right now. Um, that's where it stands for me. I, I could see it definitely moving up uh, with, with a rewatch, but I personally give it an eight right now. And I think, I'm, you know, I'm going to stand firmly by that. And I, I really do think that Vanessa Kirby is, is going to be there for the Oscars. And I, I think she genuinely deserves a spot. Yeah, so do I. I also give it an eight. I really hope she has a shot. I think this movie's gorgeous. I think it's unforgiving. But I think yeah. that it has that glimmer of hope at the end. You need to not be entirely helpless. 
or hopeless. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a film about tragedy, about the worst tragedy a person can go through. I think, yeah, one of them anyway. And I thought everybody did an amazing job. I thought it was well written, well directed, and I hope to see it come award season. But because of Shia, I will not be holding my breath. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely understand that. You know, it's um. I just don't want people to just just disregard it completely because of one person that's involved in it. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I think if you've listened to this episode, you probably have seen it. <laughs> but uh, hey, you know, keep keep watching new movies, and you never know what you're going to get, uh, especially at this point, because they're going to be coming out left and right through streaming services. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're going to uh, we're going to be closing out with a new segment, which we call the spotlight where we shine a little light on some films we've been watching outside the podcast, the oddball personal stuff we watch on our own time. So without further ado, here's the spotlight. So what are some films or film that you've, uh, you've been checking out this past week on your own time? Well, um, you know, you know me, uh, Oscar Sunday is kind of where my, my heart is when I'm, you know, throughout the week watching stuff. I really use that podcast to catapult my brain into different places within that year mm-hmm. or, or within an individual. Um, so we have a, a Gaslight episode coming up on Oscar Sunday this weekend. And that's from 1944. And that would be uh, Miss Ingrid Bergman, you know. And I looked up on uh, Criterion if there's anything, and uh, uh, Autumn Sonata is on is on there. So I have watched that, um, but I'm going to talk about that on Oscar Sunday more because that's an Oscar nomination for her. I just wanted to mention that that's kind of usually where my where my week is at is kind of like dedicating it to stuff like that. But the thing that I have watched recently that was kind of for my own time, something that I've been kind of, you know not dying to see, but I've, I, it's been on my list because it's a, it's a debut. I love directorial debuts. I love seeing the first thing people did feature feature uh, lengthwise. And uh, for this, for this one, it was Gus Van Sant's Mala Noche. And uh, you know, I thought it was okay. You know, I give it a seven out of 10 overall. I think there's significant signs of him being, a, you know, a super good filmmaker uh, early on in the film, but I think it starts to drag big time uh and it's only an hour and 20 minutes so it's just there's not a lot of time and i I just feel like he didn't know exactly where to go at times uh he wrote it with walt curtis and it's about um about about three three dudes three young dudes essentially who who are in portland uh one of them is from portland and the other two guys are from mexico um there's you know there are mishaps and it's it's seen as a film that's important the reason i really wanted to watch it was for gus van sant but also because uh, it's seen as kind of a pre precursor to the, you know, new wave of films that are going to come out in the, in the nineties that are all, you know, like Cheryl Dunye and oh, even Gus Van Sant with like my own private Idaho. It's, it's all, all these films for the LGBT community that are good films, awesome movies that have cool characters that aren't just your typical, you know, your typical, like, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like when you have a gay character, a gay character in the eighties usually was very stereotypical and and kind of annoying. It was like, what are you doing? That's not really how people are. And so Gus Van Sant's Mala Noche definitely is changing that because the main character is, is just not stereotypical is very much just a, a dude that you and I would like to hang out with, you know, just a, just a dude. And so to see that kind of happen prior to all the stuff that comes out in the nineties, that's very much speaking, you know, like, um, What's his name? Uh, Ari. Uh, God, I cannot think of his name. Uh, Mysterious Skin and Totally Fucked Up. What is that guy's name? <laughs> I'm on. Uh, yeah, yeah. You look that one up. I'll, I'll keep speaking. Uh, you know, I like watching films that kind of inspire those waves. And Molly Greg Rocky. Part- yeah, Greg Rocky. There we go. Uh, yeah, he's Mysterious Skin's like one of my favorite movies of the 2000s. And I like seeing movies that inspire those, you know, those ideas and those waves and putting different kinds of gay characters on screen. I think that's really cool. 
But as a film, Mala Noche just like didn't totally do it for me. It's from 1986. Uh, it's black and white and it's filmed. It's very interesting how it's filmed. Um, I would recommend it to people who like Gus Van Sant and want to go down that road. But it's not, you know, it's not something that you got to see, right? Just from like a film standpoint of, of it being like quality. Uh, it's, it was fine. Uh, it, it's on Criterion right now. Uh, that's how I watched it. And I'm looking forward to watching more Ingrid stuff throughout the week. Nice. Nice. I'm coming up on uh, uh, schools about to resume. So my free time is about to take a dive. <laughs> so we will uh, yeah. we'll see yeah. where that goes. I think I'm going to be spotlighting a lot of Oscar Sunday movies in the future. Uh, yeah, there you go. Well, what, what do you have for us this week, though? Well, ever since the uh, incident at the Capitol, um, the attempted uprising, which we won't really get into because this is not a political podcast. Yeah. Um, and that's that doesn't deserve like attention. That was so mm. silly. Yeah. <laughs> I've I I I wanted a reminder of who we are as a nation, of who we can be, of who we should be. And the film I immediately gravitated was uh, towards was 2000's The Patriot, which is one of the few films made about the American Revolution and a film that I think showcases it extremely well, really, you know, hams up the patriotism and, you know, dedication of forming a new nation against the tyranny of the British. And I'm a huge history buff. The Revolution is my jam. So I love this movie to death. I finally moved it up to a 10. But with that, I got on a bit of a Mel Gibson kick. And I finally watched <laughs> the 1996 action thriller Ransom. Nice. Which is very 90s. Very cool idea. It's Mel Gibson, Rene Russo, Gary Sinise, Delroy Lindo, Donnie Wahlberg, Liev Schreiber. Hell of a cast. And uh, basic idea is Mel Gibson plays a multimillionaire airline owner whose son is kidnapped. And the ransom is $2 million. So he immediately wants to, you know, play ball. So he gets the FBI involved and they, they encourage him to do the payoff. Handoff goes badly. And Mel Gibson's character realizes no matter what he does, whether if he pays these guys off or he doesn't, they're going to kill his son. So he's like, fuck it, I'm taking control. So he goes on the news and instead of paying the ransom, he offers $2 million to anybody who is willing to bring him the kidnappers dead or alive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's fucking badass. It's one of his greatest moments as an actor. It's so cold, but like you can still feel he's afraid of, you know, this might be a huge mistake. And Gary Sinise is the kidnapper. And seeing him kind of be like, you motherfucker, like on the other side of it is so good. And like just every, the way everything works out, it's such a great movie. It's well, early Ron Howard. He directed it. There you go. And you can tell that this guy's going to go places. And yeah. It's, it's a great movie. It's, you know, very nineties, but still a solid watch. And um, it's not streaming anywhere. I had to get it in the mail, but uh, yeah, very, uh, I like, you know, despite all the shit he's done and said, I still, I like a good Mel Gibson movie. Sorry. Yeah, well, that goes, <laughs> no, I love that. That No, I, I love that you brought that up. That goes hand in hand with my adoration for Shia LaBeouf's performances in Honey Boy and, you know, Peanut Butter Falcon and Borg vs. McEnroe, you know, and Honey Boy or uh, American Honey. Sorry. I, I love what he's doing in all of those. And I'm okay with saying that while at the same time admitting that he probably should be working on a set right now. And I think Mel Gibson definitely has some, some gems in his career, yeah. but probably shouldn't, you know, probably shouldn't, you know, um, always be working around some people, you know, cause he, he said some crazy shit sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is the Patriot one of my favorite movies? Yes. Do I absolutely adore Gibson's performance in it? Absolutely. Would I want to sit down and have a beer with Mel Gibson? Absolutely not. The guy sounds like a horrendous human being who has said more shit against the Jews than anybody else I've heard of in this generation. So, no. But the Patriot, Heath Ledger, Jason Isaacs, Jolie Richardson, Tom Wilkinson, I mean, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's beautiful. And I will always defend that movie. You had me at Tom Wilkinson. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
that's yeah that's my spotlight hell yeah man yeah i i love doing these you know because you just never know what random stuff you you've been watching but but yeah man i mean a lot of stuff i watch is definitely geared towards oscar sunday Mm -hmm. uh you know because we're doing that once a week and we for example like 1974 we just did chinatown so you and i were trying to watch movies from that ceremony and see if we think chinatown really should have maybe beat godfather part two and we kind of came to the conclusion that we do think it should have and that's like what's so much fun about it and you know it's going to take the whole week to do that sometimes uh which which is great but it also takes away that just kind of organic you know, movie choosing when you just scroll through shit and you're just like, ah, fuck yeah, I'm gonna watch that. I do like that occasionally, but at the same time, it's nice to have stuff that's kind of scheduled for us to watch because you make sure you're watching something a day per day, you know, at least a movie a day. And I, I want that. I want it, I want it to be sometimes work and fun at the same time. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I want there to be a balance because I want to be consciously learning and growing and knowing what I'm watching, but also having fun with it and finding that balance is what these shows are all about. Yeah, for sure. And I think we've found a pretty good balance. I'm going to have to refine that balance for, for grad school, but you know what? It's all part of the, yeah. if I didn't have this, I'd go insane. <laughs> if I couldn't talk about Mala Noche <laughs> for five minutes, I'd lose my mind. Yeah, man. I, I think, I think it's so much fun. I think, I think next week is, we're just going to continue. This train's going to keep moving. I think next week's going to be a lot of fun as well. And, these streaming services are going to be, you know, kind of our, our guide as we move through 2021. Indispensable for sure. On Wednesday, the Filmgasm podcast is doing the 1999 remake of The Mummy, starring Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weiss. On Oscar Sunday, we're doing the 1944 Ingrid Bergman psychological drama Gaslight. Ooh. <laughs> Next week, according to the release calendar, we'll see the release of The Marksman in theaters and One Night in Miami on Amazon. Uh, tune in next Monday to see if we're able to cover either of those films. And if there's anything that we've missed for next week's possibilities, please reach out and let us know at filmgasm at gmail.com or Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at filmgasm productions. Thanks for listening and have a lovely week, everyone. <laughs>